Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I'm Maria Thompson Corley. If that quote from Philippians resonated with you, stay tuned. I'd love to introduce you to intriguing, creative people whose light is making our world a lovelier place. Welcome to Finding Beauty. England, classically trained. He's performed at over 500 live events in the last 10 years alone. And he was featured on Guitar Star, and that's a Sky TV um, competition where guitarists compete with each other to, for who's the best, whatever that means. But anyway, he was featured and he was one of the people who moved on. So, you know, he did very well with that. Um, he studied flamenco in Andalusia and Latin guitar in Rio de Janeiro. So got it from the horse's mouth. And his corporate clients have included uh, 20th Century Fox, Google, Bulgari, Audi, GM, Sainsbury, United Coffee, Three Mobile, Fiat, and there are more. And he's performed for celebrities like Emma Thompson, Dustin Hoffman, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and Michael Douglas. And he's, he's making it as a freelance guitarist, and that is in and of itself a major accomplishment. So, Peter Black, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks so much, Maria. It's a pleasure to be here. We've been listening to um, La Canción de la Felicidad, which means the happy song. And um, Peter, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I met a lady who was running a music school in Spain. And I started, well, I visited her for the first time because I had a problem with my posture. And that's what the music school was aimed at, your posture. Mm -hmm. I, I fell in love with the mountains. I found them kind of a very enriching and spiritual place to be. And so I kept returning there. And one year that I went there, there was a flamenco guitarist called John Amir Haddad, who was running a, a flamenco course very close to where I was staying. Um, so I had some, I joined in on this uh, course and picked up a few techniques and I was just inspired to try and make something with the ideas that I'd learned. So basically, I use some of the techniques, but in the harmony of the song, the song basically just uses the classic one, four, five chords. And if we've got listeners that are not very musical, you know, those chords are basically the chords that you play, use in Jingle Bells and Happy Birthday and many, many pop songs. So... But I, I found that there was a beauty in those very simple major chords. And when I put it together with the flamenco technique and the harmony and some simple melodies, I just found that the song for me was the epitome of happiness in its simplicity. That's mm -hmm. what appealed to me about it, that maybe happiness itself is something very simple and you know, maybe we look too far for happiness and we put it into objects, people, places and things. Mm -hmm. And so for me, philosophically, there was a link between the simplicity of the music, the simplicity of the harmony, the feeling of the music and perhaps the philosophical reality of the simplicity of happiness. Okay. And um, I, I knew we'd get philosophical. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> well, no, I mean, really, I, I, um, somebody else I was talking to um, was talking about the fact that he was so philosophical because he actually majored in philosophy. And I said, well, I'm not sure I'd want to talk to someone who couldn't at least begin to get philosophical. So, um, okay. And that's from your recording Shades of Black. And um, I know that that covers a wide variety of styles. It, do you have any favorite styles or is it just depend on your mood? Yeah, that, uh, that was, that's quite a difficult, it's a good question, but a difficult one. Mm -hmm. um, so, I wouldn't say it necessarily depends on my mood, but perhaps I see it a bit like food. I can appreciate gourmet food, mm -hmm. but I might not want it every day. There might be one day that I want a burger. Mm -hmm. and, and I think music's very much like that. 
you know, I can appreciate music on different levels. I love Bach, but I don't think Bach would work very well at disco. Right. <laughs> and at a disco, pop music might get the dance floor moving, but I couldn't honestly argue there's anything particularly interesting from a musician's perspective about your average pop song. It's very <laughs> often quite simplistic. So I haven't got a favourite style. I think, yeah, actually, you're probably right. It probably is a question of mood an occasion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, what made you want to play the guitar in the first place? I think it's two things, actually. Uh, if I look back, I can remember being touched emotionally by music when I was too young to even know what an emotion was. Um, so I can remember that sort of feeling this, getting this feeling welling up inside me as a result of listening to music um, but also my dad was what I would call a guitar dabbler. Mm -hmm. You know, he loved guitar music and he had a guitar and he grew up with guitar as a hobby, even though he wasn't particularly accomplished without meaning to be rude about him. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so we had an old beat up classical guitar at home. And I can remember, I got memories with him and my brother sitting in our old dining room. And I don't know whether I was six, seven or eight. And my dad would literally just sort of roughly bang out some Rolling Stones or a bit of uh, Buddy Holly or perhaps the Animal's House of the Rising Sun. Mm -hmm. And I could see a joy in my dad while he was doing it. Perhaps that attracted me now that I'm in this conversation because my dad's also got, always had a disease. And so I also used to see a lot of pain in my dad. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps I was uh, attracted to the joy and just like any child that watches someone enjoying a toy, it was a toy that I wanted to grab and play with. Mm -hmm. And so I saw, my brother didn't, you know, he didn't, wasn't particularly interested in it. And um, my dad would then show me a few chords and I literally picked up what my dad taught me very quickly. And that's, that's how it started. And you just ran with it from there. <laughs> um, so how did you know that you wanted to make it a career? That's something that I didn't really feel until I got into secondary school in the UK, which is around 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And then you meet a whole batch of new people and then you're exposed to new musical tastes and all kinds of new things in life. And my dad bought me my first electric at that age. And there was an older boy living up the road whose younger brother was about my age. So I was being exposed to new musical tastes and this older boy, who was about 21 when I was 13, wanted to get some young boys in a band. And I joined the band and I, I don't know exactly when it happened, but my first dream of a career in music sort of came around 13, 14, 15 when I decided that <laughs> I wanted to be a rock star for want of a better goal. I mm -hmm. wanted to be a millionaire rock star. Sure. <laughs> you know, like Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and whoever else. Yeah. And that became my primary driver until my very late teens. I could carry on to answer this question fully. I don't want to sort of overrun your podcast or spoil how you want the interview to go, but there's a kind of second part to that answer oh, no you can go ahead go ahead if, if so you start maybe, boring me I'll, I'll i'll edit <laughs> <laughs> leave that in there leave that in there that'll be great for the viewers to hear that okay uh, and then you could have a bit of off cuts at the end of the series and keep them interested <laughs> so, sounds good sounds good go ahead <laughs> well so you know that whole experience with rock i, I did feel that as a musician and as a band, we had something very magical, but there's always the business of keeping a band together. And there's always the business of, well, you have to pay bills. And I think to an extent, being a rock band is a kind of all or nothing dream. You either make your money or you don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so life took over, I had some personal problems. And around about 19, I felt, I felt like I wanted to leave the band and I needed a really fresh start after, like I say, some, quite severe personal problems, which I don't mind talking about if you ask a different question. But what okay. happened yeah. <laughs> what, what happened was I, I ended up um, working in insurance. Really? And, wow. Uh, 
age 19 working in cargo insurance and basically I kind of decided look I want a career in music but I don't want to do it in a kind of all or nothing dream way mm-hmm. I want to I want to have some real skills that could function and, and provide me with incomes that I can imagine right now mm-hmm. like t- teaching performing composing arranging and so I decided to start studying again classically theoretically and with an A-level in music to get my place in university and so that was my second dream to kind of be a working musician and that dream took life around the age of 19, 20 mm-hmm. and I sort of managed to put it in practice by the time I was about 27 I started working in music hmm. properly. I mean I've had jobs that were summer jobs or that were jobs that I knew I didn't really intend to stick with for any length of time. Um, And there was a year that I took off between the bachelor's and getting a master's where I worked in an office as a receptionist. And that was just, you know, that just confirmed for me that I I really have to figure out a way to be a musician Hmm. because this is just like, I I just can't imagine it. I know some people do it as a hobby, but I guess, you know, if it's that much of a passion, yeah, you just, what else are you going to do other than feel your soul die slightly every day? Um, But, um, you know, obviously uh, anyone listening to that recording knows that you are a virtuoso and you worked very very hard to get to that level so um you know it's not like it was just given to you obviously and um that leads me to my next question which is um am i correct in saying that you really are a freelance musician in that everything that you do is you know it's a gig here or a student there but you don't have any sort of uh, regular day job that that fills in the blanks is that correct absolutely correct okay so i was going to say is that freedom of freelancing or is that scary or is it a bit of each? Well, um, I totally empathize with what you said in the lead into that question about sort of feeling a calling Mm -hmm. in your soul. Um, In terms of, yeah, I think it's a mixture of both. So Mm -hmm. I, you know, if we look at the word free and freelance, I think it's a, a bit of a misleading word. If if we look, you know, around to a real concept of freedom, you know, how free can we be in life? Because we've got needs that we have to meet. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, once you get into freelance and, and you want to earn some money, you know, I could say, well, it's great that I've got my days free to sort of practice or, or scheme or do whatever I want to do. But that's only because kids are at school and adults are at work. It's not mm-hmm. like I've chosen to have the morning free. It's just that the morning is free because. And is it really free? <laughs> I mean, are we really free? <laughs> so much. I mean, I, I'm not completely a freelance musician. I have a church job. Um, but, you know, the fact that my schedule is quite flexible in some ways just means I'm moving things around. There are things that need to happen. But if it needs to happen earlier or later, I have that flexibility. Is that is that what you find? I mean, then my next question had to do with the fact that even if you are really, really good, um, having a career as a musician is a lot about the business and promotion and all that sort of thing. Have you learned to love that part of it? Well, the answer is partially mm-hmm. because I think, I certainly feel from my own perspective that there's an ultimate truth that lies within each person. But it's not so easy to arrive at that truth because, and and this is just what I've come to believe over the course of my life, and I don't want to project it onto anyone else, I just want to state it in its own terms, that I feel that we've all been conditioned in some way. It, It could be by our parents, by our schools, by our society, by newspapers, by the news, by anything and we take that on board. And psychologists might refer to that understanding of us as unique individuals as the ego. Mm-hmm. And, and then I also believe that we have an essence. I just believe it. And I believe that we're all unique in our essence. And so without going too far off the beaten track, I do think that the ego in life, it causes us to compromise because the ego of us does wonder how we're going to pay a bill. You know, people say, let go and let God. And it's very scary to let go and let God because 
you know, does God write your checks for you and things like that, you know. <laughs> and, and you see the people are, from my perspective, as someone who has been in organized religion all my life, you see some of these people you're supposed to revere, like these saints, and, you know, they're completely abandoned to God and then they get martyred or <laughs> they're beaten regularly or all these things that don't perhaps sound appealing to me. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, so, no, I, I hear you. And I think this is the essence of self-promotion. If you were promoting your true essence, what you absolutely believe in because you know it, why wouldn't you feel good about that? Why wouldn't mm. you feel absolutely at peace with that? Yeah. But I, th I think I'm only partially partway along that journey. It's something I'm really trying to uncover at the moment. And so I think while there's an element of what you do, and I don't mean this in any ungrateful way, it's just something I'm aware of. I'm grateful for the work I do. I'm grateful for the kids I teach. But I know that I'm not 100% where my soul is. And so I know there's an element of compromise in what I'm doing. And I think that element of compromise tinges that desire to put yourself out there because somewhere deep down, you, I know that I'm not quite at my true self. Hmm. You know, um, another person I was talking to the other day, um, he and I have, I, I realized he's given me so many opportunities that have been, you know, like sort of career highlights when I look at them, for example, my very first commercial recording and introduced me to the person who uh, gave me pieces to record that well he didn't get them to me to record but I ended up making my first solo piano recording and we went to the List Academy in Hungary because he invited me to accompany him collaborate with him and also um, you know he performed at Carnegie Hall and he invited me to collaborate with him and these are all sort of in the rearview mirror and I found out this other thing of some uh, recording that first recording was featured very prominently by a very famous singer in his national broadcast. That was five years ago. I didn't know anything about it. And, you know, I was thinking um, every once in a while, I sort of feel like, you know, are you using everything that you've been given to the best of your ability? And I feel like I'm trying my best. But then there are times when, you know, as far as the compromise, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to go off on my own tangent, but I, I think I understand, or I at least I'm personalizing some aspect of what you said and, and applying it to thoughts that I have myself as to what do you do to survive and what would you do if you were really able to pursue the things that feel most deeply important um, if you know if you were allowed to just do that is that a fair or is that just a tangent I think no I think you're absolutely right I mean it's very difficult, I think, to get to, to ultimate truths within yourself mm -hmm. because for a start, you've got to be looking for them. And, and then who knows what kind of um, sort of interference you've got to get through to find them, what doubts you've got to overcome. And, and not only that, but I almost feel that life is like you're going through a virgin forest with a cutter blade. And the thing is, if you want to carve your own path, you've got to cut a lot more than if you want to walk down the path that someone else has cut. Mm -hmm. And so therefore I think the tendency is for two reasons, for that as one reason, but also because we're aware of all the other parts. We mm -hmm. know we can get private to, uh, lessons or we know people want music at weddings and, or there's church jobs out there and school jobs out there. And we know all that. Um, and so it's easier for us to put that into our plan Mm -hmm. than to think of something absolutely unique that who knows that might be the thing that really bangs that might be the thing that takes you to your place but you have to bring that out of your imagination mm -hmm. so I, I think there are those challenges to doing to following your true unique path is, is a challenge and on the other to not to be um uh, I don't know, the devil's advocate. But um, on the other hand, I suppose when you, you went back to the simplicity of happiness at the very beginning, and I suppose there are those who are able to find contentment in whatever situation they're in. And again, I'm going back to um, Paul and my, you know, the Paul from the scriptures, the Christian scriptures, and this idea of being content. And so, 
you know, if I have these different jobs and this is a thing within me is sort of, you know, I'm trying to bring what I can to these situations and I can get some joy out of doing these different things, even if on certain days I'm th I think maybe, you know, is this the best use of whatever particular gifts that you were given? But I, um, I think that there is something to be said also for wherever you are finding a level of contentment, sharing whatever you have with whoever is willing to accept it. And then as, even as you are leaving open the possibility that, okay, maybe you don't want to play wedding number 265, having played wedding number 264, is there some other choice? But um, anyway, because I know, I mean, when you're talking about weddings, of course, I'm a church organist, I've played a million weddings. And the bride and groom are always really thrilled and I'm kind of like, eh, another wedding, you know? <laughs> and, um, but yeah. I mean, I know that I'm giving them something very special that will be meaningful to them. So there's that duality, but okay. Let me go on a, a slightly different track. Um, so you were a finalist I saw in a 2008 songwriting competition. And so I was wondering how long you have been composing. Well, I think I started writing music when I was 14. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be 25 years now mm -hmm. uh, and I've but I've been on, on and off with it I found that unless I invent a reason or there is an actual reason to write music then I can forget you know and, and just sort of turn that side of me off so I mean I, I first started writing for bands and I've had various intervals of writing sort of songy type stuff Mm -hmm. for I mean, like, like pop songs or just um is is that kind of the, the genre that you were writing in being originally, in a rock band, I think. originally yeah it was rock and i've done some sort of various styles of rock and a bit of soul um mm -hmm. and, and and maybe some sort of poppy songs and mm -hmm. then i and i've done um sort of small chamber ensembles I've done one or two piano works to be honest really <laughs> yeah well, you mean, must send them to you must send them to me I mean, to be scan fair, them and send them. I don't even know if they're even in existence because I did them at uni on an old computer. I don't even know if they're in existence, but maybe they okay. are. Well, and if you find if you find them, you, I mean, I will be kind. In <laughs> I would love to hear. hear yeah, I, I, sure, absolutely. Send me something. So, so this is a good um, talking about how you started writing. Um, I guess this is a good segue to Shady Blues. So, so can you tell me all about, or a little about Shady Blues? Sure. I mean, I, I think blues in itself, I think it's very hard to be original nowadays mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I think the genre is very set, sort of harmonically. It has um, to be. Otherwise, it's, it's not really blues. <laughs> that's right. And, yeah. and, and so in line with sort of the title of the album, mm -hmm. one of the ideas in that, song is a picking technique that a friend of mine taught me a, a gentleman called christian buckle who's got some brilliant music out there mm -hmm. um he's a guitarist so he taught me a picking pattern that's slightly percussive mm -hmm. and then you know some of the solo from that i stole from an unplugged version of before you accuse me um, performed by eric clapton okay I, I mean and obviously it follows a pretty standard 12 bar blues harmony and it has some sort of shuffling six in it and um, yeah, so I mean, with that song, it's my blues song, but I would say of all my compositions, it's probably one of the least original. Right. But I just really enjoyed it, sort of throwing a load of almost cliched blues ideas together mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. making it into a piece of music. Well, sure. Why, I mean, as you say, I mean, especially if you don't have words for the blues I mean I guess that would be the place where you you could have you know something that no one had ever come up with but uh and in your uh improvisations have to be you know the exact way that you do it has to be yours but yeah the blues is the blues and if you're calling it the blues and it doesn't have those har harmonies then you know people are going to wonder why you're calling it the blues <laughs> exactly. but, um, yeah but I mean and and um I noticed your album had um some of these originals and then also um, Recuerdos de la Alhambra, is that correct? By Terega, which is very well done. Yay, that, my one year of Spanish comes in handy. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, um, and so um, as I, I, I saw this as, you know, shades of black, so this is the range of 
of Peter Black at that moment of, of I assume you chose just pieces that made you happy or was it mainly okay well I need another slow piece let me you know pick something or I mean I assume that every piece on that recording is something that you really enjoy playing is that a fair comment yeah there are thereabouts I mean mm-hmm. I mean I personally I, you know I think you're an incredibly accomplished musician thank you but I mean, but, I mean you know how difficult it is to go into a studio because suddenly you can hit one note wrong yeah and, you know then you've got to do the whole song again yeah or parts of it or parts of it these days we can edit at least but uh, but it's it's difficult for some some things i know like the recuerdos must is must be very difficult to edit because it just keeps coming so um i've seen that i think that's the thing you know with i've got different experiences of music and I find that a solo classical instrument is a very, what I would call a very naked um, thing because there's no drums masking it, there's no bass, and and really it's sort of, so. Th- there were two things behind the album. One of them was yes, I wanted to sort of say, hey, these are the shades of my personality. I'm not just a classical player. I'm not just a flamenco or blues guitarist you know I like to do all this stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> and then on the other side of it there are some songs there that they're no joke to play mm-hmm. and there I are some tell. songs there are some songs there that are not particularly difficult mm-hmm. and and when it comes to sort of putting 15 or 16 tracks down I couldn't pick every tune to be a sort of handbreaker no so no. some some of them are easier than others and Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps at the time I loved them all, but one or two of them bore me a little bit now. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That That's fair. Um, okay, so um, your schedule, I know, in order to um, survive is crazy. What keeps you inspired other than just living and wanting to pay the bills? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think ultimately... I'm the kind of person I have to keep myself inspired. Mm. I mean, I have to work at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it can be sort of motivational books, you know, positive books or spiritual ideas. Because I find that musicians don't necessarily inspire me. Sometimes I look at musicians and I kind of think, oh, wow, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. Sometimes mm-hmm. seeing other musicians actually can demotivate me no oh. you know you can see some 16 year old kid from china who knocks out a, a lute suite and you think oh my gosh you know but but are <laughs> they are they musical though are they are they just are they just i mean and i i'm impressed with fast fingers too but i mean are they saying something or are they just playing all the notes fast i'm with you there is there are plenty of people doing that or you know there's plenty of gifted musicians that might well end up being bankers mm-hmm. so yeah. i I, j- I just mean to say that, I mean, we've had the odd conversation in the past and I'm the kind of person, as you know, that I need to manage my mind. If mm-hmm. I let the weeds of my mind grow, they mm-hmm. tend to grow into things that are not so pretty. So mm-hmm. to keep myself inspired, I think it's on one level knowing that there's something in my soul that I want to get out, that I'm here to get out mm-hmm. in, into the world. And on the other level, it's a matter of keep getting my mind to the right place so that I will keep moving forward and not give up. Okay. So um, this, you're, you're setting me up beautifully here. Um, Because I was going to say, um, you have had a rather colorful past, uh, not for a rock musician, but you are not a rock musician. Um, And so would you say that music has helped you along your journey? Like if you, knowing that you have music and that um, music is a way to process, or I shouldn't say that. I will say that I have used music sometimes to process emotion, not solely music. I've used many other things. And I suspect that in the course of our conversations, you've gotten some sense that, you know, I mean, my journey has been one where I sought a lot of assistance from various places. Um, But would you say that um, music has been part of your process of getting, keeping the weeds at bay? 
Um, a part of it, yeah. I mean, I-, I could answer that question the way that I feel to answer it, if that suits you. Well, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think music as a subject or as a hobby, as a passion, you know, it challenges you in many ways, doesn't it? I mean, if you think of where you start, you know, playing your Do Re Mi and your Ferro Jeca, you know, that path of growth going from there to high levels of classical performance, there's a, a challenge in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and that challenge requires a level of dedication. And so dedication, I do believe, is a skill of personality that, you know, if, if you want to get results from anything, you need to be dedicated to it, whether it's your family or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and in another sense, I think that um, knowing that I, I think that music is probably one of the few things that I can live for. Mm. You know, like, I mean, I think probably most of us, we can live for other people, not live for them what they want, but live in... No, I understand what you mean. I understand what you mean. Yeah, and and maybe we can live for our spiritual beliefs and we can live for the beauty of our planet and maybe we can live for our fellow mankind, but there's plenty of stuff out there that is quite abhorrent and quite painful. So, yeah, I think music, knowing that I've got something, I'm sure if I didn't have music, there'd be something else. I think that's the way that life generally works for us. But, yeah, I think having that music there in my core, it, yeah, it's it's like my bread. Mm. Okay, so... Um... I'm, I I wanted to play a little bit of um, La Cancion del Espiritu, um, which is the song of the spirit. Um, this is another one of your original compositions, as you know. Um, so I think it's an appropriate backdrop for my last couple of questions. One of which is, how do you define beauty? And how important is it? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a very difficult question. Um, So in terms of defining beauty, I think you can look at it in a very straightforward way and say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, Mm -hmm. what, what someone finds beautiful in aesthetics can be a matter of their own personal taste, if you like. And you are the beholder I'm talking to, so... (laughs) Well, that's it. I mean, I think so. There's there's aesthetical beauty, mm-hmm. and I think there's also beauty of action, because you know, someone performing a kindness mm-hmm. is is beauty. It's beautiful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, is it beautiful if a millionaire gives a hundred pounds to charity, a hundred dollars to charity, or is it beautiful? if someone who's poor gives every penny to charity. I mean, they're both nice acts, but I think beauty can be defined in aesthetics or in in deed, in act. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm sure that, you know, this is a very, sort of could be such a deep question. I'm not sure my brain can handle it in its entirety. Okay, that's fine. but, But possibly beauty could also be you know an element of the universe and spirituality and all those sort of things that you know people have their different approaches to but Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think life I've got a feeling that despite the pain we have in this world that in its essence life is designed or is supposed to be beauty because it makes you wonder what would be the point of it if there was not a, quite a lot of beauty to be appreciated mm-hmm. or created? I think, um, yeah. And, and um, so, wow, this is going very smoothly <laughs> as far as one question leading to the next. But um, do you think that art can change the world? Well, I think there's a very sort of logical sense in which you could say that every time you breathe, you change the world in terms of the composition of what goes in your mouth and what comes out. True. So so I think there is a sort of very simplistic way to say that everything changes the world. 
True. You know, um, and, and I think it depends, therefore, where you, where you're aiming your question. Mm-hmm. You know, does the music for the better? I guess does art can art change the world for the better? I mean, there is so much going on, and over here, anyway, I don't know how it is where you are, but um, you know, the first thing it, that gets cut in budgets is art. And uh, so our, our National Endowment for the Arts, for example, was cut. Now, perhaps I think state-sponsored art is more of a thing in Europe. So maybe that's not a question that um, would resonate as much uh, as it does over here as far as deciding well, what is, is art important or is it sort of an indulgence? Yeah, no, I hear you with that um, question. And I think the answer to the ultimate question is a resounding Yes, of course, art makes the world better because, I mean, I think you only have to look at culture to see that certainly music and and art in terms of cave paintings and things like this just seem to be an intrinsic part of human nature. And even the birds love to sing. Mm -hmm. And so, and if we look at our culture, you know, what would a party be without music? So... I think art itself is absolutely essential to humans and it makes the world a better place already. Mm -hmm. It already makes the world a better place. You know, if you only have to imagine a world without any art or music. Yeah, I I don't don't think that would be possible. (laughs) Um, Okay, so um, another thing I meant to ask you, if people want to find out more about you or find you online, where do they go? Well, for the moment, I wish I had more online than I do. I think in today's world, it's really time to be pumping it out. But for the moment, the best thing they could do is go to youtube.com forward slash Peter Black Guitar. Okay. And there's a, quite a few videos on there. They can mm-hmm. read a bit about me and see a few pictures of me and stuff like that at www.peter.com black guitar p-e-t-e black guitar dot co dot uk i do have a facebook page which is woefully neglected okay. and i think that that's facebook.com forward slash peak black guitar and i also tweet about twice a year <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i think that's twitter.com forward slash peak black guitar but I'm, I'm hoping that um i'll be a lot more out there for people to hear a lot from me in the mm-hmm. future at all those places because you have a lot to say. Obviously, I do, Maria, don't I? I mean, <laughs> I, th- I think I do have a lot to say. But yes. I, d- I just hope in the end that some of it's worth listening to. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you once again for taking the time. Um, this was complex to organize, at least for, for me, my tech-challenged person. But I'm so glad that we finally did this. And I'm Maria Thompson-Corley. And thank you for listening to Finding Beauty. The theme music for Finding Beauty is Symphony of Light, written and performed by Kiana Corley, with assistance on the cello from Allegra Banks. Rusty Banks was the producer. Right now, you're listening to Liszt's Petrarch Sonnet Number 104, performed by yours truly. You can hear the rest of it on my CD, Music from the Novel Letting Go, available on CreateSpace and Amazon. If you're interested, you can check me out at mariacorley.com or mariasworld.us. You can also find me on Twitter, at Maria Corley, or YouTube. My recordings are available through Albany or Amazon. My novel, Letting Go, is available on Smashwords, CreateSpace, Barnes & Noble, and Amazon. Or drop me a line on my site, and I'll send you a signed copy. I want to leave you with one more quote. Do your little bit of good where you are. It's the little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Desmond Tutu. Have a beautiful day.